Welcome to the I Believe Podcast, an Acure Insight production, brought to you by Castle Biosciences. I'm your host, Danae Peterson, a fellow ocular melanoma survivor. Here on the podcast, we'll be sharing information and insights on treatments, research, and living with ocular melanoma. Castle Biosciences is a proud sponsor of this I Believe podcast. Castle Biosciences tests are designed to provide clinicians precise and personalized tumor information for the benefit of patient care. If you would like more information about how Castle is transforming the treatment of eye cancer, visit castletestinfo.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the I Believe podcast. I am joined here with Dr. Mohamed Dar, who is the chief medical officer of Immunocore. So um, Dr. Dar, can you tell us about yourself, your career, and just you know what excites you as you get up in the morning? Hi, Danae. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I think back, you know, from my earliest um, memories as a kid, I was always attracted to, to science and the love of science. And that ultimately led me to pursue a career in medicine. And I remember the first few years while we we're in medical school, we were always excited to go and visit with patients. And it just so happened that the patients that I had a chance to visit with were patients living with cancer. And I was so impressed with the strong bond that existed between these patients living with cancer and their treating physician or oncologist. And ultimately, I I was moved by that. And that was part of my motivation for pursuing a career specifically in oncology. And that ultimately led me to the National Cancer Institute, where I got my training in oncology. And it's there that I was exposed to cancer research and clinical trials, because the patients that came seeking treatment at the National Cancer Institute were patients who had really run out of options. They had exhausted all available therapies, and they were seeking um, experimental uh, treatments. And so that exposure to clinical research really is sort of what drives me and helps me sort of wake up in the morning, which is really not accepting as good enough the current available standards of care and really focusing on how we can move the needle to bring better treatments that can improve upon the current standard. I love that. Thank you. And I can, I mean, as a patient myself, I can relate to having a good, strong bond with my oncologist. And I think that's so important. So it's, um, I think it's refreshing to hear that that's also a rewarding part of the experience for doctors. Um, so what is your role currently at Immunocore and why did you decide to become part of their company? My role is uh, chief medical officer and simply put, that's a role that's focused on taking exciting science that's coming out of our research labs and trying to make that a reality in the clinic in the form of clinical trials. And that, as you can imagine, takes a village. So the other part of my job is to help build teams, recruit really um, motivated people who are focused on the same mission of designing and executing clinical trials to test these novel treatments that are coming or medicines that are coming out of the research lab. Love that. So um, what drew you specifically to Immunocore? My motivation, and it's often sort of a similar motivation for others that have joined Immunocore, is really the exciting science that's being pioneered here at the company. And not only that, I think what's even more exciting is the potential for the science to be turned into transformative medicine. So that potential is really sort of what's motivating for many of us, including myself, to have joined Immunocore. I love that. So can you give us just an overview of Immunocore as a company, like their mission and what you guys do within the group as a whole? I'd love to do that. So Immunocore is a global commercial biotechnology company. Most of our offices are primarily in the UK and in the US. And the mission that really is driving the company is a desire to dramatically improve outcomes for patients living with cancer, um, infectious diseases, and other autoimmune conditions, leveraging um, and developing really pioneering um, and transformative uh, medicines. Oh, I think that's amazing. And I think that's got to be such a rewarding avenue to be to be a part of, just like on the cutting edge um, of, of new technology and, and new medicines. I love it. Um, so what led Immunocore specifically to work in the space of the rare disease metastatic uveal melanoma? Ultimately, it was um, the science. The science really led us to focusing on diseases like melanomas, which 
can include cutaneous melanoma and uveal melanoma. And ultimately, when we looked, the unmet need was so much greater in metastatic uveal melanoma, where it was clear that no specific therapies had been developed for decades. And so it's the combination of the science led us to the melanomas and the significant unmet need um, in metastatic uveal melanoma sort of led us to focus on that on that disease. Well, we're definitely grateful that you guys decided to focus on it. It's it's definitely a gift. So immunocores technology is new and very different to kind of the typical technologies that we've seen for developing new science, new medicine. So can you explain just in layman's terms what TCR therapy stands for and how TCR therapy works and what or how the immunocores TCR therapy is actually different than your typical? So I think if you step back and think about the you know, oncology field in general, there's been a lot of excitement around immuno-oncology, which is sort of trying to leverage the patient's own immune system to target cancer. And over the last decade, decade and a half, the main sort of types of immune therapy that have, you know, come to fruition and now are, are available as treatment options really focus on using antibodies, which is one type of, you know, immune mechanism, but uh, using antibodies to unleash the the patient's own immune system. And one of the challenges with uh, antibody-based sort of medicines is that they can really only target proteins that are on the surface of of the tumor cell. And if you think about the entire sort of library of proteins that our body makes, only about one in 10 proteins are actually on the surface. And so while these immune therapies have been very successful, one of the limitations is that you can only really target one in 10 proteins because that's how many, you know, that's the percentage that are expressed on the surface. And so what's really the focus of the technology that Immunocore has been working on using TCR technology, which really stands for T-cell receptors, is that TCR or T-cell receptors have the ability to target proteins that are hiding inside um, the cell. So really the potential to unlock the nine out of 10 proteins that are produced and only are expressed inside the cell. And that's really important, especially um, for cancers, because a lot of the cancer-specific targets are inside cells, not on the surface. So that's one important difference with uh, the technology that Immunocore has been working on versus some of the other technology that's out there. The other thing to understand about the the platform that Immunocore has been working on, which is called IMTAX, which stands for Immune mobilizing monoclonal T-cell receptors against disease X, X being cancer or infectious disease, is that this technology has sort of two parts to it or two arms to it, because there's sort of two ends to the, the, the technology that Immunocore is working. And so one arm, as you were mentioning in your question, is this TCR um, part and, or the T-cell receptor part. And the way to think about it is that arm is designed to target the tumor or um, the virus, if it's a virally infected cell. Um, but then the other arm um, is designed as a hook to pull in the patient's own immune cells. And so if you can uh, picture this or envision this, the technology is acting almost like a bridge uh, where one end, uh, the TCR end, is targeting the tumor uh, cell and the other end of the bridge is connecting or hooking in the patient's own immune cell. And when it forms this bridge, um, it activates the patient's immune cells to target and kill um, that cancer cell. So that sort of in a nutshell is both the technology, uh, how it works, and also how it's different from sort of what's been out there over the last decade, decade and a half. Yeah, no, I think that's so interesting. Um, and just just for anyone who maybe doesn't quite understand what the role of the T cell existing in the immune system is, can you just explain, you know, what does the T cell do for the cell? Yeah, no, um, absolutely. So if you think about the immune system, there are different sort of parts of the immune system. Uh, one of one of the um, parts is the T cell. There's another part of the immune system called the B cell. And the way nature designed our immune system, it was designed to sort of cover all our bases. So um, B cells, uh, which are sort of cousins to T cells, they're designed to produce antibodies and protect us from um, foreign things that might be floating around in our bloodstream. Um, So more soluble um, uh, sort of foreign uh, proteins. The T cells, as you were uh, mentioning, they're the the other part of the immune system, and they're really designed to target um, 
foreign proteins or uh, cancer that is essentially hiding inside cells. So the B cells are designed to target foreign things that are floating around in the bloodstream, and the T cells are designed to target foreign things that are hiding inside um, cells. And in this way, nature sort of covers its bases and makes sure that it's sort of surveying and protecting us against dangers wherever they may be lurking. That's so cool. Um, I feel like the immune system is definitely um, a part of science. That the more that I learn about it, the more fascinating it is. Some cancer therapies are dependent on a patient's HLA type. Can you explain just what that means and how patients can find out what their HLA type is? Yeah, no, absolutely. So the, the, I think the best way to think about HLA is it's a type of genetic marker. Um, and um, this a number of treatments people may have heard of, like transplantation, require um, for, for you to know um, your HLA uh, status. So HLA testing is, is, is common. It's available um, you know, in hospitals and clinics. So the best way for, uh, for patients to find out their HLA status is to go speak with their physician and they will um, order, it's a blood test that um, you know, can be sent off and then they can get um, the answer in terms of what their HLA um, status is. So some, some patients kind of wonder, you know, what is HLA type? Um, so what is HLA typing? Like we have blood type, um, obviously, you know, got a positive O positive, you know, these kinds of different blood types, but the HLA typing looks different. It tends to have, you know, more numbers with it. What is, um, the difference between blood type and HLA type and are they similar? Are they like just their own thing? Yeah. Um, they're, they're definitely different. Um, and so, um, the HLA typing, um, there, it, as you said, there are lots of um, different letters and types, and so it can be quite confusing. But I think the best way to think about it is that there are two, um, remember I described to you, um, yeah, so there are two types of HLAs. There is an HLA that's called class one and an HLA that's called class two. And they relate to different types of immune cells that can detect antigens or proteins on the surface. And so the, the function normally, you know, you might be asking like, well, what's the, you know, there are different types. What is their function? Their function really is that these different HLAs are designed to present different types of foreign proteins on their surface. And so you can imagine how different and various the different kinds of varieties of foreign proteins, including our own proteins uh, inside our body are. You need different types of almost like holders to present these different proteins. And that's why there are all these different types of HLA, but they're part of our natural body's defense. And that's why it's important to know your type, especially when you're undergoing, let's say, organ transplantation, because you want to match these HLA types between the organ you're going to receive so that your body or immune system doesn't view it as foreign. So some people may have heard the term adaptive clinical trials. Can you tell us a little bit about what those are? That's a great question, Danae. So the, the adaptive clinical trials is just part of our approach in the clinic. So in addition to sort of the innovative science that we're working on in the research labs, we're also working on or thinking about innovative ways to conduct our clinical trials. So often the traditional sort of approach to clinical trials is that there's a phase one, phase two, and phase three types of trials, you may have heard of that. So phase one often is just focused on safety and trying to figure out what the right dose is. Phase two looks at sort of initial signals of activity. And then phase three usually includes uh, some type of randomized trial where you compare the new treatment against established treatment. So what we mean by adaptive trials is that some of our trials try to combine phase one and two together or phase two and three together. And in this way, what we are ultimately have the potential to do is perhaps shorten the overall development time so that instead of taking, you know, five years, it could be two and a half to three years that you can get to the answer that you're looking for by combining more than one phase of the trial into just one integrated study. So that's sort of what we mean by uh, adaptive trials. Okay, so Dr. Dar, if patients wanted to learn more about current trials and or research for uveal melanoma, where would be the best sources? So I would recommend two places specifically. One is that they can go and search on clinicaltrials.gov and search under uveal melanoma to see what uh, trials are available. And then, of course, armed with that information, they should go speak with their physician um, who can then guide them in terms of what trials might be best fit for their current situation. No, that's so important. Definitely talking to to the physician. And like you said at the beginning, having that connection with your physician and just making sure that, that that bond is there 
that patient to physician bond, I think is so important, so valuable in that communication process. So um, Dr. Dar, we're to the end of our interview. So is there anything you'd like to say just to wrap up as we close out? Yeah, Danae, thank you so much for providing this opportunity to have this discussion with you. You know, what I'd like to leave with your audience is that I think we're really at a very, very exciting time when it comes to cancer research and drug development. Um, I think, you know, there's been a numerous sort of periods of time where there's been rapid innovation. So if you think back almost 100 years ago, there was, uh, you know, really nothing available for cancer treatment and we had chemotherapy and radiation and surgery. And then towards the end of the last century, if we can say that, we had the sort of emergence of targeted therapies, which was truly revolutionized um, sort of cancer care. And now over the last decade and a half, we are seeing sort of the renaissance of a new class of therapies called immunotherapies. And so I'm really, really hopeful that within our lifetimes, as we begin to figure out how to combine chemotherapy with targeted therapy, with immunotherapy, and putting all of these together with better detection, that cancer maybe, you know, some cancers may be cured, but certainly cancers can now become, many of the common cancers can become basically a chronic disease the way we think about heart disease or diabetes, and that that will no longer be a reason for people to lose hope and become a cause of, you know, common um, uh, mortality across across the globe. So I think it's a really hopeful message that pe- people should take away in terms of where things stand with cancer research. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And just, I mean, as a patient myself, I know we definitely benefit from that kind of hope in the research field. So thank you for sharing that. I hope you have a good day and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much for joining us today on the I Believe podcast brought to you by Castle Biosciences. Please be sure to subscribe. And if you're so inclined, send this episode over to friends, family, and share on your social media to help spread awareness around OM. If you have a moment, leave us a brief review or consider making a donation to the links in the show notes to keep our podcast going. Feel free to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Acure Insight. We'll see you next time on the I Believe podcast.